Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night live stream. Last week we started off talking, going over the basic prophecies again. So we talked about uh, Daniel chapter 2 and the statue. And basically we concluded that those are the festivals um, or the, the uh, metal empires rather. Uh, and the end with Rome. And we found out the Roman Empire, as according to that prophecy, basically ends in 1945, uh, probably, or thereafter. So there might be more to that story. And then there's the feet and the toes. So if you want to see that video, uh, that's online. This week, we want to take a, a look at Rome in general. In a lot of the uh, rabbinical writings, Rome is referred to as Edom. And so I wanted to kind of go back and look at how they get that, how they refer to that. So, for instance, we know the prophet Obadiah. Now, Obadiah is going to be talking about Edom, about three quarters. And it's a very small chapter. It's just 15 verses or so. But three quarters of it are all about the destruction of Edom. And we think, well, that was, you know, 600 AD or thereabouts in the ancient Edom Empire when it was completely, totally destroyed or whenever it was. But then there's this stuff at the end. And then you begin to realize the stuff at the end, part of it was fulfilled in our lifetime in the 1940s and, and on up. And part of it, the very end of that hasn't been fulfilled yet. So we go back and we realize if we're talking about Edom as Rome and there is a Roman Empire revived and a um, false religious system, that comes into being it might be connected with end time prophecy and that's kind of what we're looking at according to the scrolls everything that's in the canon was put in the canon because it relates to end time prophecy so for instance if obadiah was only for old edom or old babylon or something like that it wouldn't have been added to the canon now, that's their concept that might be right it might be wrong but that's a dead sea scroll is seen concept or a Zadok concept. So what we want to do is stop just and go through this one piece and kind of look at the ancient history of Rome, how it got started, and why it's why it's actually there. So to do that, we want to go back to uh, the first book I ever wrote was a book called Ancient Post Flood History, and uh, basically what we try to do with uh, that particular one, and you can kind of see it here. We Actually, let me just go back to uh, this here. So in ancient post-flood history, which is this one, it was put together. Um, and this is a remake of it, nine new chapters. Uh, 2010 is when we remade it. But basically, this is how it works. We have source documents describing what we're doing. We, we take Genesis, um, Exodus, Kings and Chronicles those things as a basis for our chronology and then other historical works from the jews like jasher josephus uh, things like that that tell us more names more details then we go to those places where the 16 grandsons of noah were and find out uh, if there's any historical documents legends or whatever that match the jewish legends and most of the time we find those so we went through a basic chronology, pre-flood, post-flood, not much pre-flood history actually in this. There actually is quite a bit of that. But then we go into how Europe, Africa, and Asia was divided between Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And then we talk about Japheth's descendants, Ham's descendants, and Shem's descendants. And one of these under uh, Japheth's descendants, we looked at Britain last time and uh, Russia to find out their names. So we found that Magog, in the land of Magog is the old Scythian Empire, which actually is Russia. So when the Magog invasion occurs in Ezekiel 38 and 39, we're talking about somebody from southern Russia today, and as a Scythian or Scythian Empire. So pretty interesting. So today we want to look at Italy because we're talking about Rome, not, not necessarily Roman Catholicism or the city of Rome, but the ancient Roman Empire or how Rome or Italy came to be and so if we start off with this most of these have this in each chapter this is chapter 14 in the book and what we do if you have 
went through Genesis really well, you'll find that if you start in Genesis 5 and you tally up the years from creation to the flood, it's 1,560 or 56 years. And so that's our dates here in the AM scale. So this is 1656. Then if you continue to tally them up all the way to the Exodus, uh, you find that the Exodus was in the year 2448. So 2448 minus 1656 is 792 years. So less than 800 years, we have the time from the flood to the Exodus. So Egypt becomes a nation, then splits, becomes the two nations, and then completely destroys itself or is destroyed by the plagues in 800 years. So when you take that concept and plug things together, you can begin to reassemble the timeline. Uh, plus things like Joshua's altar today, you know, things like that, uh, which dates the Exodus for 14, 1500 BC instead of 12. So pretty much everything's being vindicated. But in this uh, 792 year time period, we, in this chapter, want to look at Italy. Who are the descendants, the one who are the 16, out of the 16 grandsons of Noah, started the Italians? How did that work? What kind of histories do we have? So we're just going to go through this, the bulk of this chapter here. So the most ancient history of Italy records that there was a person named Sabana. Okay. And Sabana was a grandson of Tubal. And he settled in what would be called Italy. Now, it's interesting you go back to, to Meshach and Tubal and some of these guys. And this is one of the things we talked about when we're trying to figure out Magog. There's Meshach and Tubal. A grandson of Tubal came and settled in Italy. That's not necessarily the Tubalites, but it's something to try to figure out. So the lands are what we're wanting to look at for prophecy. So according to legend, then, he founded a city and named it after himself. It was called Savannah. And what's really interesting, if you go back to some of the ancient histories in some of the secular colleges, they'll talk about there was a group of people called the Sabians or Sabines. Uh, it's called different, different by different people, but nobody knows where they came from or who they are. They just kind of appeared one day in Italy. And then there's these legends, which we're going to get to, like the Rape of the Sabians uh, or Sabins. Uh, and these, they say it's myth. Much like everything else, there probably wasn't a Noah, there probably wasn't a Moses, there probably wasn't a George Washington, all this kind of weird stuff. Everybody says the historical records don't really mean anything. They're probably, it's all myth. But this is what we have. So actually there were Sabians, okay? They, they were a group of people and they were in Italy and their records are their records. Um, but we know that then it's a grandson of Tubal. Okay, so he settles there and it creates this group of people. They're somewhat peaceful on one section of Italy, what would what we now call Italy. So sometime afterwards, uh, Chittim or Kittim, Rome, was founded. So we're going to talk about the founding of Rome according to ancient Roman history. So Rome is founded. They begin to, now we're not talking about the city of Rome per se, but the Romans come, they find stuff. Their original city capital was a a city called Alba, and then they created Rome as a city, moved the capital there, and it became the capital of the Roman Empire. But what happens is the people begin to come. So you have natural disasters, you have wild animals, you have all sorts of things, problems, and the population was not growing. As a matter of fact, it was beginning to shrink a little bit. And this, this has some implications for us too, but basically, in order for Rome to grow quickly and not shrink, a decree was issued that any criminal okay, that would come and help colonize Rome would be declared a free man and made a Roman citizen. So you're a criminal being you know, in jail somewhere else, right? If you can break out of jail and manage to get to Italy, you will be given, you'll be exonerated. Don't care what you did before, you are a Roman citizen and you, you're free. So that, that was the deal. And so that allowed a lot of people to pick up and come to the country. This is a reason why, and I'm trying to say this nicely, every nation should have borders and border checks. 
Uh, today, we have the ability to check and make sure people aren't diseased. But are they criminals? You don't want criminals coming into your society and changing your society. Um, but some people in the government think that's better than shrinking. So, I mean, immigration is fine. They could have done it a different way. It would have been slower, would have been better for them. But the history is specific. So Rome grew quickly. Uh, they did this decree, and this attracted a lot of criminals, and it caused the sons of Tubal to not intermarry or trade with them. So if I live in a city and you're the next city over and everybody's fine, everybody's godly, everybody's Christian, and you do a decree like this, and now all of a sudden there's nothing but gangs and who knows what kind of criminal elements over there, we're not even setting foot in the city. And there's no way I'm going to let my daughter date somebody from that city. He may be a good guy, but the criminal influence, it's just, there's no way. So the entire group of Sabians decided, uh, we're not messing with this at all. Okay. So contrary to what's written in history, secular Italian history has theorized that it was a tribe called the Sabani that came from the Adriatic coast. So they're assuming and guessing that it might be Greeks from the other side that came over here. We know it to be the grandson of Tubal. Uh, okay, so anyway, so uh, according to the book of Jasher, this is part of the history that we have. In 2039 a.m., that's when Abraham was 91 years old. This would be basically nine years before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and circumcision of Isaac and those things. That's 383 years after Noah's flood, according to the chronology. The Romans descended, or decided rather, uh, that they, since they could not trade or intermarry with the children of Tubal, apparently they were successful and grew large. Rome had that problem of growing, got the criminal element, and still had a problem in growing, probably because of the criminal element. So because of that, they decided they would secretly slip into the cities, steal as many of the young women as they could, and take them back to Rome. Now, this sounds like uh, kidnapping and rape, and it may or may not have been that per se, but even if you coaxed someone and a young girl decides, I'm going to run off with this guy and, and marry him or whatever, uh, we call that today in our society statutory rape. She's not old enough to make that kind of a decision. Her parents would have to make that decision for her, and they have said no, okay? But someone comes in and decides, I'm going to take her anyway, and that's just all there is to it. Well, they did that to a bunch of different people. Again, possibly not forcible, but however that works, it, it's a problem with the two groups of people. So that happened. So Tubal, Tubal's children, the, the Sebians, gathered forces in order to start a war to free their daughters. The war lasted eight years, according to Jasher. By 2047, which is just 54 years after the fall of the Tower of Babel, the Sabian daughters all had children of their own. And in an effort to stop the war, the Romans stated that if the Sabians did not stop the besiegement of Rome, they would put their own daughters and grandchildren on the front lines. So like it or not, they're all family now. So that basically, there's nothing you can do. You just ended the war and they went home. Uh, and so this event in secular history is recorded or called the Rape of the Sabians or Sabines or Sabians. It's used different way, but that it's an interesting thing. And it's a legend. You can actually go online and look this up. And there have been famous artists to create statues commemorating this, this event. But again, secular history says it probably never happened. Who knows? Well, it's recorded in multiple Jewish history books. Okay, so basically in the year 2255, 17 years after the children of Israel migrated from Egypt, okay, Jacob died at the age of 147. He commanded his children to take his body back to Canaan, okay, to bury it in the cave of Machpelah, which is where Abraham was buried. Esau heard of this and tried to prevent it. So at this time, Esau, of course, was he had moved to Mount Seir and it became known as Edom. And so those are the Edomites, the Esauites. 
and he still said that he has the birthright okay so in the scripture we know that jacob uh purchased the birthright to him for pottage and there's a whole story behind that but basically that's what happened so the birthright goes to jacob esau on the other hand says no i ain't doing that i mean i i was stupid as a kid i said something but i'm not honoring that so now jacob is coming back in to bury or the, the children of Israel are coming in to bury Jacob and Esau is going to prevent it because that's his area, his land and his inheritance is what's in his mind. So Esau had heard of this. Uh, so to prevent it, claiming Jacob has no right to be buried there because he has his birthright. The sons of Esau attacked Joseph in the, ca in the cave of Machpelah or close to it. Joseph and his brothers and the Egyptians who were with him fought back and Cushim, the son of Dan, the son of Jacob, so grandson of Jacob, actually beheaded Esau. So it's a really interesting story in Jasher. Now, the interesting thing about this, and this starts an entire chain of events uh, dealing with how Rome is founded. <clears throat> One of uh, Esau's grandkids was a guy named Zepho. Now, Zepho was the son of Eliaphaz, son of Esau. He swore revenge on Joseph for the death of his grandfather. He mounted a counterattack even before Joseph was able to get back to Egypt. You know, they took and buried him and then they started coming back. Zepho's forces were quickly defeated. He was captured and then put in prison in Egypt. Okay, Esau's sons uh, took Esau's body to Mount Seir and buried it there. Afterwards, a coalition of the children of Esau and the people of Seir, together with the children of the east, went to make war with Egypt and Joseph and the Egyptians. And the main attack of this was the city of Ramses to free Zepho. Now, this is interesting because, number one, we think of Ramses as being the pharaoh of the Exodus. And what we're going to find is that there was a city, Ramses, and it may or may not have been called that at that time. But there was a city and it was almost destroyed at, at this battle. So then it was recreated among other cities to be fortified cities. And this is how the children of Israel got involved in building Egyptian um, uh, cities, fortifications, forts. And that's when one of the pharaohs later on decides we're going to pull back and use that as a cover to enslave the Egyptians. So it's an interesting part of the story. So it goes on. So they decided to do this, but they were again defeated. Okay. The Syrites demanded that the sons of Esau leave Seir and go back to Canaan, but they refused. So thus the children of uh, the Syrites, the children of the east, together with Midian, went to war with Esau. So it caused a skirmish inside that kind of coalition. The children of Esau, uh, together with the reinforcements from Aeneas, the king of Africa, uh, fought with them in the wilderness of Paran. So Aeneas is an interesting guy. We talked about him briefly a few weeks ago when we were looking at the British history to kind of see how all that formed. Uh, basically, there was this Trojan War, and we kind of know about the Trojan War. After the Trojan War, there was uh, a person, probably more than one, but one particular person that escaped. His name was Aeneas, and he took his troops down and built and founded basically Carthage, created a small empire on the north side of Africa. And then the rest of the, a lot of those people were enslaved, the Trojans, uh, or they're basically Greeks when you look up the lineages. Later on, fourth generation from Aeneas, uh, his son Brutus frees the slaves, takes them uh, out past the Pillars of Hercules, which is the Straits of Gibraltar, and goes up to uh, this island. And uh, we know that today to be England, England, uh, which comes from Angleland, but anciently it was called Albion. And he forms uh, a city, which begins to be the capital, and he calls it New Troy. Later on, it's renamed London, and that's the London, England we know today. So it's a lot of interesting history of that, but that's all of the Trojan, British, Welsh history. So in this case, there's this uh, war between that and the Edomites. Remember, Edomites are Esau's descendants. So in 2270 AM, 
which is 32 years after the children of Israel migrated to Egypt, uh, Margon became Pharaoh. And that's a name that we're given in Jasher. Uh, it may mean something. It may actually be the exact name. But anyway, he placed Joseph, who was 71 years old at the time, as ruling vice Pharaoh for 41 years. Uh, they put Joseph as complete control of Egypt. Uh, basically, we'll kind of skip over some of this stuff, but they did several, several things. So in 2288, the Edomites, along with the children of the east and the children of Ishmael uh, and the forces from Aeneas, attacked Joseph at Ramses. Joseph again defeated them, according to Joshua 58. And then a few years later in 2309, Joseph died and he's 110. We remember that. Uh, and then he's buried. Uh, at that time, there are people that are sympathetic. They're beginning to be anti-Jewish. They don't want a Jewish guy ruling over the Egyptians. They want a native Egyptian ruling over them. So there's always some of this, uh, I don't know, racism or whatever you want to call it. You don't want a foreigner ruling over your group. Their ways are different. So anyway, in uh, 2310, Zepho manages to escape Egypt. Don't know how was bribery or someone broke him out or whatever. Maybe certain people didn't look look the other way, so to speak. But anyway, he flees to Aeneas in Africa. That's the area of Carthage. And Aeneas makes Zepho captain of his host. He's a, a very, very skilled warrior. So Zepho tried unsuccessfully to convince Aeneas to attack Egypt. And there's no reason for Africa to attack Egypt just because of Jews. So they're not going to do that. So Zepho left Africa and went to Rome. Uh, he led many successful battles for Rome and was eventually crowned king. At this point, there was no Roman Empire. It was Italy. And there was a city, I call it Rome, but there was no Roman Empire, no city of Rome even yet. But the city states of Italy basically were some were friendly, some were battling together. And there's a whole lot of interesting history behind it. But basically, he uh, subdued all of Italy, Italy and the surrounding islands and pulled together and created the first united Italy. So that's the beginnings of the Roman Empire, the city-states. He reigned over, over this newly created Roman Empire or Italian Confederacy for 50 years. And so here are some of the, the dates with uh, the names of uh, Esau and his uh, clan until Albinus of Rome conquers Edom. They keep, again, uh, Edom keeps trying to get Rome or anybody to attack Egypt and it keeps causing trouble. Then there was some problems and so Rome actually comes out and conquers Edom at one point. There's no Jews in Israel. There's no, uh, because they're still in Egypt. So there's a lot of that stuff going on. And some of them, of course, escape up into, into uh, to Israel and on up to Lebanon and that whole area. So anyway, interesting thing about this, you may remember in Italian history, the legend is that Rome was founded by uh, two kids, uh, Remus and Romulus, if I remember correctly, and that they were nursed by a she-wolf. You probably remember that and everybody knows that that's not possible but that's the legend and it's not made up this is a great example of how pagans take history garble meanings and assume we're talking about monsters or gods or whatever and just paint a picture well zepho ziev in in hebrew is wolf so zepho is a way of saying a wolf so if Zepho pulled together the city-states, and if we go back through the history, there's quite a bit of it, but there were two major warring factions, and he pulled them together to form a united kingdom. You could say that Zepho, a wolf, nursed or pulled together a kingdom mainly from two opposing people, Remulus and Romulus. Um, so anyway, it's an interesting history, and you can kind of see how things get garbled along the line. And I may be pronouncing the names totally different, but, you know, Remus, R Remulus, Romulus, things like that. But you remember the story. So another interesting thing of this is that uh, 
uh, Zepho is the first one. There's a there's a report of a guy named Uzu, and we don't know if that's another name for for Zepho or someone else that was trying to pull the city states together. But Zepho is the very first king of a united group, and after him, when he leaves, he hands it over to one of those groups, and this was a guy named Janus, and we remember in Roman mythology uh anciently janus the god of doors he's he's the two-faced god they have coins with him looking this way and that way at the same time um so it's interesting everybody says it's just a made-up thing uh january our our word january is said to be based off of janus and that's why you get pan babylonian people say well you can't say january because it's pagan again pagans misunderstand things if the very first king that was not an Edomite, the very first native Roman or native Italian king of a united Roman empire, so to speak, was a guy named Janus. Janus would be the god of doors. Later on, pagans would make him out to be that way. So our January is not pagan per se, the name. It simply commemorates one of the original or the original Roman Italian emperors. Just like August is for Augustus Caesar, July is for Julius Caesar, things like that. Anyway, so there's a lot of that. So then in 40, 2435, Alba was made the capital of the empire. And it remained that way for about 400 years until Rome is completely finished. So then the capital was moved to Rome sometime after 2550. So 20, approximately 2855, somewhere in that neighborhood. So anyway, so there's a lot of interesting history on this. But so in seeing this, we see that Rome is started by Italians, the children of Tubal, the children of Chittim. Both, both of these groups were um, uh, Japhethites. Okay, they should be there. There's Greeks and there's Romans and there's other people. And we have Esau because of a problem with that. Uh, you've got... Um, Jacob going down into Egypt, Esau being killed because of him trying to take back the birthright, his grandson being a key player in the establishment of the Roman Empire. Now, again, he goes back later and, and other things happen, but there's always this hatred, uh, perpetual hatred between Esau and the Edomites and um, uh, the Ishmaelites, even and those people against uh, Jacob or the Jews. So you see this interesting thing going on. So later on in a lot of the texts, since they were connected, and then later on, the remnant of the Esauites were captured, taken to Rome and enslaved. And this, the uh, Syrites or the Edomites in that, in that sense ceased to exist. Now, other people came in and took the name of Edomites. And so Edom is still Edom. And so that's what's interesting today. If Edom was supposed to be the one to rise up and attack somebody, we're not talking about the ancient Zepho and his children or the ancient Esauites. Uh, we're probably not talking about the people that moved in after he left. We're talking about whoever's living there now, if they were to start a war, whoever that may be. Hamites, Japhethites, Shemites, whatever. But we're looking at this stuff to determine, number one, in prophecy, where things are and how things are coded so all the way through a lot of the rabbinic writings they talk about edom as a power rising up in the last days that's obviously not esau or ishmaelites well possibly islam that kind of thing but they're talking more like an empire type thing so it's obviously rome and its connection with that so all through the rabbinic writings they'll talk about Edom as being Rome. So again, when we go to some place like Obadiah, and it talks all about the, the ending parts are pe things that happen in the 1940s in our time. There's two or three pieces of Obadiah that's actually been fulfilled in our lifetime. And then the very ending part has not been fulfilled yet. And that lets you wonder, why are we talking about Edom from a couple of thousand years ago and then stuff today? What, why, why this? And if we begin to realize that Edom is a code word for Rome, and we're talking about not Roman Catholicism per se, or Islam or anything, maybe, maybe not religious, but the empire. 
And the empire itself, as we learned last week, was uh, abolished in its, at least right now, its final form in 1945. So World War I and World War II had to end the empire. But now, of course, they're talking about the revival of an empire, and that may or may not occur. And there's some other prophecies that talk about Russia and how that's connected with the Roman Empire. But this study, I just wanted to share this with us, with everyone. And this basic idea of the Esauites and in prophecy, when you see something about Edom doing something, it could be that Roman Empire or some offshoot of it. So that's as far as we'll go tonight. Just something to think on. And again, this is basic old history. And most historians today would laugh at this and say, there's no way that could happen. The dates are off and blah, blah, blah. But it is what it is. There are records that say that. So however that works. They used to say that uh, the, the uh, Jews, if they actually even came there about that time, would an, a type of exodus or something would have been about 1200. And maybe half of that stuff is fiction because there's no records that they can find of Jews being in Egypt in the 1200s BC, which makes sense because they weren't in Egypt in the 1200s BC. And the biblical record shows that it was 1500 BC. And then recently in the last 10 to 20 years with the discovery of Joshua's altar and the curse tablet, things like that, with uh, uh, Proto-Hebrew being written on the curse tablet, it's pretty obvious that it's a 14 to 1500 BC uh, object, which is obviously Israeli, kosher animals only sacrifice there, uh, things like that. So there, there's more archaeology that's beginning to explain the biblical narrative. So we'll go ahead and stop there for tonight. And I'm going to flip over to the chat room to see if there's any questions. Looks like we got a few. Okay, our first question. After studying Habakkuk today, I saw that God speaks harshly against the Chaldeans. I also read that they are modern, that they are modern day Catholics with ties to Turkey. Can you speak to this? It's glitching a little bit. Um, I don't know how that would necessarily connect with it. Um, there are child, there are some legends about the Ch Chaldean mystery religions and some of the practices of the mystery religions possibly being some of the practices in Roman Catholicism. I don't know that we can really prove or disprove that. That's about as close as I can I can come to because the Chaldeans being Babylonians or today we call them I Iraqians, you know, people from Iraq uh, wouldn't necessarily have anything to do with the Italians uh, or Italy or something like. And they're Muslim, whereas Roman Catholics are Christian or Roman Catholic. Uh, so ties to Turkey, I'm, I'm not too sure about as far as like the the original catholic or not catholic but roman empire when it split into two there was rome and the holy roman empire in the west and there was byzantium in the east byzantium's capital was constantinople which is now istanbul turkey and so it it ruled as a christian empire up until 1453 bc or ad rather and then uh at 1453 AD, they were taken over by Ottoman Turks, and that created the Ottoman Empire, which lasted officially until 1917 in World War I. And then they tried to revive it uh, under Hitler and, and things like that, and that fizzled out with World War II. So there's possibly some connections like that, but it's more of a connection with Turkey and the Roman Empire or Byzantine Empire than Roman Catholicism, as far as I know. I mean, I've, I've heard, like I say, some of those ideas, but I've never really um, um, been able to tie those together to prove or to disprove it. So then Rome was pretty much always been a magnet for criminals, uh, according to the ancient text, yeah. And that's the same thing 
you get a um, a country. Uh, United States is one. I I live in the United States. I'm thinking of the United States, but any country. I, take even a smaller country like Britain or Scotland or Ireland or, or somewhere like that, some small country. Uh, if their population begins to shrink, they either start having more kids and or allow people to immigrate to the country or they simply cease to exist. And the problem is most countries have always been, they allow immigration people to come in but you need to adopt the customs of the land you are. So if I was to move to Scotland or to Ireland, I need to start speaking that language or whatever language or languages they speak in Scotland and Ireland, just using that as an example. And I need to start doing the things that they do. I need to become a Scotsman or an Irishman, intermarry with them. And I don't come there and say, I'm an American or I'm a whatever, and I have different values. Well, then you need to go home. So that's the problem. And when you open the border and let anybody and everybody through, you're going to have people that want to be there, that want to become Irish or Scottish or English or whatever. And then you're also going to have people that um, don't want to be. And that destroys the, the nation as it is. So if what made Scotland or Ireland or England or one of those places, Netherlands, Swiss, whatever, whatever made them unique, they're their own people. You get other people coming in, changing the religion, the customs, the practices. It won't be that nation anymore. So if you don't have enough people to replace your population and you don't watch carefully who comes in and make sure they migrate into the country and become part of your group, uh, if you don't do one or both of those things, the country ceases to exist. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing, but that's just how you keep the nation. So in that case, you know, however Rome started, it might have been halfway decent. But when they did that, um, that caused all sorts of problems, you know, with all the, the criminal element, um, the history of the rape of the Sabians, um, the people surrounding there not wanting to do anything with them. So pretty interesting. Most countries, if you go somewhere and you just say a, a cute girl and decide I'm going to take her, not anything even bad from an American standpoint, but just she likes me, I like her, we're going to run off and get married. And you don't ask permission from the parents, give a dowry, do something, follow the customs of that land. You're going to be very evil spoken of and possibly killed. You just don't walk in and kidnap somebody's family member and we don't look at it that way it's like well she wanted to go with me it's just that's the way americans do stuff maybe but that's not the way they do stuff and that's one of those things you got to be careful of so we the united states is called the great melting pot but we still have to respect each other's beliefs and customs uh, so you come here from another place you have a different set of customs than i do i should at least respect that you know we shouldn't Otherwise, we're going to have problems. I'm, you're going to try to kill my family. My family is going to try to kill your family. So you got to be careful with that. So, yeah, and there's a lot of other historical uh, things like that. But it's just amazing to me that we have ancient Jewish history books like Jasher, Josephus, uh, things like that that will tell you half of these things. And, of course, the main reason for looking at that and the reason I put that first book together is to find the 16 grandsons of Noah. And a uh, major reason is to find out for sure what the names of the old land lands were. So I could know for sure who Tarshish is, who Magog is, who, uh, well, Egypt's the easy one, but who Egypt is, where Egypt's at, uh, Libya, things like that, Israel, Lebanon. Lebanon's another easy one. It, it's always Lebanon. So as far back as you can go in the writings, but to make sure we know who these people are so we can figure out prophecy better. Do you recommend the book by Israel Yarden, the scroll of the war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness? I don't know if I've read his version of it, but the scroll of the war of light between the sons of darkness, uh, it's... Uh, it's one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, so I don't know if his translation would really be the better or not. 
but it is an interesting read. And I don't think we've ever taught on it on this channel. We need to do that sometime. Which one of your books did you write about the 22 sects of the Essenes after John's death? Okay, um, there were 22 sects of Gnostics, and that's in ancient uh, church fathers and also in the, uh, actually, let me look that up here real quick. So, um, let's see. Ancient church fathers would have a lot of stuff on the Gnostics. So, they would, there were 22 separate schools. Uh, they, the, now, these are cults, and it's good to study the cults just to see that they are 99% us, except there's one or two points that are really, really weird, and that they were a dangerous group back then. We have cults today that claim to be Christian, so we got to be careful of that. But the 22 Gnostic sects are in here. And then also the demonic gospels, this one right here, is all about the Gnostic texts. So that's the 22 different Gnostic cults. As far as the scenes, there were two or three different versions, or let's say four different breakoffs of the original Essenes. And that's in Hippolytus, and I don't think I've actually put that in a book yet. So um, something to look for later, though. Actually, I take that back. That's probably in, um, as far as the four different types of Essenes, is probably in uh, Ancient Origins of the Hebrew Roots Movement. So this one right here. The reason I say that is because uh, they talked about they are the ancients, okay? And that's the original way. And the three breakoffs, there's four of them, the original guys, and then the, the, the breakoffs, one was what we call sacred name. You had to, and I don't remember what their name was, but you had to, uh, let me turn my volume down here. You had to um, um, say the name of God, whatever they thought the name of God was. You had to pray with that name, etc. cetera. Uh, so we call that sacred name today. There are some people that would say you can't pray in the name of Jesus. So Jesus, Yeshua, in the name of Christ, whatever, we're talking about the same guy, and God knows. So it's not like you have to pronounce it just right, or I have to say the name of Jesus Christ in, in Gaelic, you know, Irish or Scottish or something like that. None of that matters. But these guys thought it mattered, and they were very divisive on that. And then there were also what we call pan-Babylonians. Everything is pagan. And uh, they were so strict in that way that they would not even use coins like a roman coin or something because it would have the head of it you know like a picture of caesar if i hold up a quarter you know or a coin it might have a picture of uh george washington or something it'd be the bust of someone you know on there one of the presidents and they would consider that to be idolatry it's a graven image it's like yeah but i never bow down and pray to a coin so it's not an idol but they considered it that way and then there was also, um, let's see, Sacred Name, Pan Babylonian. Oh, and then the Hebrew Roots Groups, which back then was called the Party of the Circumcision. Uh, if you learned anything about the Law of Moses, you had to convert by circumcision. And if you did not, they would execute you. They would actually kill you. And so these, these guys kind of went nuts. And you can understand why the original Essenes would not have anything to do with these guys. It's one thing to say, I would be uneasy doing that because it seems sinful. Okay, that's fine. But to come after me with a weapon because I picked up a coin or because I said Jesus Christ instead of Yeshua HaMashiach or, you know, or I have a Christmas tree in my home, so I need to be executed. So we don't have people trying to execute people today. But that's as bad as it got way back when. So those were like the four offshoots, according to, I think it was Hippolytus, or a couple of the church fathers, actually, that mentioned that. So pretty interesting. Everything gets off. I mean, you might be a good uh, Baptist, say, or, you know, or Nazarene or, or Calvary Chapel or whatever. But that doesn't mean there couldn't be a church from your denomination that breaks off and does something really weird. And that's happened a lot of times. Um. Can you explain the difference between the blessing 
and the birthright. Um, they tend to go hand in hand, and I'm not sure the whole ramifications of it. But basically, the birthright is supposed to be a double portion. So like when Jacob had his 12 sons, uh, the firstborn son should get the birthright. And that means a double portion of the land, the flocks and everything. And he would carry on the name. And in Jacob's case, uh, Reuben was first. He would have got the blessing and the birthright. But he defiled his father's bed with Bilhah. So he was ousted from that position. So it doesn't have to go to the firstborn son. It goes to whomever the father does. But normal tradition, it goes down father to son, firstborn on down like that. And the same concept comes in with kings and priests. Normally, Aaron is the first high priest. The next high priest would be one of Aaron's sons, most likely his firstborn, firstborn male child. And so the same with the king. The king's heir would be normally his firstborn son. But if there's a problem or something, he may decide to pick another person. But it should be a blood heir. And then the blessing has something to do with the blessing of God, inheriting of the prophecies, that kind of stuff. And it's probably, depending on which set of manuscripts you're looking at, much like it is in English, it might be used in different ways, birthrights and blessings. Did the Essenes give any prophecies about health and life expectancy in the end times? Actually, yeah, they did. Um, they basically talked about how, and it was like in a comparison, uh, pre-flood, you lived to be about 900. After the flood, um, you can see that people lived to be about 400. So it was cut in half only for the first four generations or so. You can just see this by looking at scripture. And then something happened. We're not sure what exactly, but it seemed to have cut the lifespan in half again. So at that point, 200, 210, something like that is about the best you could do. And so things are getting down. It could have something to do with cosmic rays because of the destruction of the canopy and, and other things like that. Um, plus, it's thought that the atmospheric pressure is half what it used to be and, and several things along those lines. But then it's, it, it's, it, can't, it dwindles down. Abraham 175. And then everybody seems to be 120 to 130-ish, more or less. And the Essenes talked about the fact that they use the Essene herbal medicine. Their lifespans stay at 120. Even in the first century AD, they live to be about 120, 110, 115, 120, something like that. And that seems incredible, but there are certain ethnic groups um, that live in certain places and everything is just right. Their genetics are just right. Uh, the, the food that they eat, the herbal medicine, and they live to be about 110 to 120. So that's in Japan, Okinawa, and a few places like that, and a few other places too. But it's really interesting to see that. In the first century, the average lifespan of, say, a Gentile, just an average person, was about 60. And the rabbis that ate kosher, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and stuff, 70 to 80 ish so and that was kind of kind of rare for that time period but and then the essenes like we say 110 to 120 and josephus actually made a comment there's a record in josephus where he asked one of the rabbis one of the essenes what did they contribute their long life to and they said it was our religion our devotion to god uh our um herbal medicine food and uh, the fact that we avoid stress or strife, anger, things like that. And I thought that was really interesting because a lot of stuff um, with when you're under stress has problems. Um, we know that if, uh, if I'm constantly angry all the time, probably wind up having a heart attack soon. My body just can't do that constantly. Or if you're always sad or always scared or something like that. And today we have problems with chemicals and stuff, and we have anxiety, and that's not good either. So anyway, they talk a lot about that, but as far as end time stuff goes, they talk about the idea that eventually 
we have um, the lifespans seem to be cut in half again. There are several prophecies, and they're from very various, various scrolls that talk about um, people that, like I say, if you go back to the Genesis, they started having kids about 130, and they lived to be 900. Well, now we could start having kids at 13. And if you're careful, you could live to be 90. So everything seems to be a tenth uh, gestation periods and stuff. I don't know about that, but as far as puberty anyway, all that stuff seems to be degraded in the same way. But they talk about people um, giving birth at nine instead of 13 and then uh, graying at 20 and, you know, possibly living to 40 to 50 ish. And so it's interesting, you know, the Bible talks about we live to be 80, um, you know, 70 to 80, and if more than that, by your own strength. Uh, so they talk about things like that. And they also talk about, and we have a, a, a group in our uh, network that we're just trying to pull together the study the herbal medicine, backwards engineer some of the stuff from the scrolls and see how far we can go. And some of us are having some pretty good success rate with it. But anyway, um, that's their medicine. But basically, uh, some of the other things they talk about are that we have an unnatural uh, obesity and an unnatural uh, dementia type thing, forgetfulness that occurs. And it's normal for you to get really, really old, like 90 and forget lots of stuff. Some people, some people not. Um, but normally it's the kind of thing like if i would say that guy that i was went to high school with what's his name and it would take me a while to, oh yeah i finally remember it it's in there it just takes a while to come out alzheimer's though for instance actually destroys those cells and there is no memory to remember so it's a horrible it's, it's thing it's totally different my mom and dad both died of alzheimer's so it's not a, a great thing um but anyway, so that happens in this unnatural obesity. And it's interesting because we talk about, you know, um, if you look up anything online about health, they'll tell you no matter what it is, you're having a problem with something. They'll say, number one, quit smoking. Number two, quit drinking. Number two, lose weight because we're almost all overweight. And then get some sort of exercise, moderate or something. Those are always the first four things that everybody herbalists and doctors and surgeons and everybody recommend it first. And I always think that's pretty interesting. Um, so anyway, there's this unnatural obesity type thing. Now we shouldn't overeat. We shouldn't be fat. We know it shortens our lifespans. Scroll says that. But if it was normal obesity, we could go back to eating salads and stop the sugar and boom, we'd be skinny. So why don't we do that? Somehow it's not that easy. And it should be, if you don't eat, you lose weight, you eat twice as much, you gain weight. It's not hard to figure out, but there's something with the metabolism and other stuff. And it seems to be connected with our food supply. The food supply seems to be messed up somehow. Um, well, I take that back. I don't know that it's food supply, but food supply, air, water, something. Uh, the texts, a couple of the texts talk about like this unnatural obesity and this unnatural forgetfulness and then the aging process and all all it says is the cause of that stuff it's caused by the wickedness of that generation and that's all it says uh but to me wickedness of the generation nobody really wants anybody dead we just want what we want which is money right so if i can make money and not hurt people that's good you know, if I'm just thinking as a secular, normal human sinner, if I have to hurt somebody, but I make lots of money, oh, well, money is the object. So when you say it's the wickedness of that generation, it seems to be um, the greed. And I don't care what we, as long as I can get by with the regulations, I can put junk in the food and then do that kind of stuff. So we have excitotoxins now in food and we have um, several things like that. Not that that's necessarily anything. I doubt that any one of these things would do anything, but it might be all of it together. And maybe what's going on right now is not even it. 
maybe in the near future something happens. But the other thing is that they always warned about uh, Genesis 6 and the Nephilim experiments. And everybody thinks that that's fiction, you know, the creating of the giants, the angels with the women. But it all boils down to genetic tampering. And there's scrolls that actually tell you how they did the genetic tampering. And it's actually fairly easy. You use herbs and you use certain types of processes and you uh, crossbreed very similar things like a donkey and a horse. And, you know, that actually can crossbreed and you do it in large sets of 200 at a piece. So there's always at least a few that can reproduce. And then you mix the different types of species together. And if you do it right, you come out with whatever it is that you're looking for. And so that's enough for us to know there's something to that, because that's how genetics would work if we were able to do that. So for them to make up a story but get the science right on the back end it's not possible so but they warn about that so in the end times there is this push for uh genetic tampering and we may not i mean we're seeing the beginnings of things like that and it may not be anything in the medical field specifically that they're talking about but somewhere along the line you can the idea that you could become superhuman or double or triple your lifespan if we just change these certain genes, something like that begins to happen. And of course, it sounds great, but if it's part of the prophecy, it backfires. And so it's, it's a really interesting thing to kind of see uh, several of those things. And we've got some, uh, some clues as to how they did their herbal medicine uh, they fermented things and there's certain processes and certain things that are mentioned so it's really interesting to kind of see and to begin to go that direction and we have a handful of people on our network that are wanting to study herbal medicine i'll just throw this out there too i live in kansas i you know most of you know i go to a calvary chapel in johnson county uh by the way we're having a uh, Bible conference this weekend, so y'all are invited if you want to come. But um, but anyway, so I'm in the Olathe, Kansas area, and I would love to pull together some actual Christian herbalists. And by Christian, I mean someone that's very serious. I mean, there's Baptist and Calvary Chapel people that, you know, could care less. They just go. But people that love the Lord and want to study prophecy and want to do what's right and want to be a family, and want to not hurt or do anything wrong, you know. And so, number one, we stay away from Nephilim technology as far as altering our genes. That is absolutely forbidden. And that probably gets us into the mark of the beast later on. Um, that doesn't actually happen till the, the, the middle of the tribulation period. But the technology going that direction is beginning to be discovered again this time around. So it's pretty interesting. So, yeah, so basically the lifespans decrease, health decreases. Um, but apparently if we use the herbal medicine and the lifestyle of the Essenes, it doesn't bother us that much. That's what I thought was amazing. I've, you guys, have, I, I think I've talked about it a couple times, but in Acts, I think it's 23, uh, four guys came down from Antioch to lay hands on Paul and anoint him. And one of them, it says, is, was Menachem. And this it even says there in, in the book of Acts, this was the Menachem that was in Herod's household. Well, we have his whole history from Josephus and the Talmud and a few other things. So if this was the guy from Caesar's household, he was an adult at 20 BC. And here he is at 60 something, you know, or, you know, basically. So he's at least in his 90s. And that's nothing for an Essene. But can you imagine a 90 year old guy deciding i'm gonna you know travel 50 miles i'm excuse me i'm gonna grab a sandwich hop on a horse and take off with some weapons and you know i'm just gonna run down there for a day or so not in a car but just to be able to even go on a trip like that at 90 years old is impossible for most of us but this was a guy that i'm sure he took was careful but it's interesting to see that. And then John being in the scene, James being in the scene, the comments they made about things. It's really, really interesting. So anyway, that's just a real brush over of it, but uh, we're trying to pull that together. And I mentioned that just because if any of you are in the 
Kansas City area, Olathe, Kansas area, something like that, and you want to study herbal medicine or maybe not want to, but you are an herbalist that's a Christian and you're wanting to connect with other people, uh, let us know. We're, it's one of the things that's kind of important. Because the scrolls talk about in the end times, things get messed up and we have to have uh, believers that are counselors, not secular, because that messes us up. And we have to have believers that are doctors, not secular. And they're specifically talking about make sure the doctors know not to touch the, the genetics. Okay. And the counselors have to know to always preface everything by you need to repent of your sins. You're not okay, and I'm not okay. There has to be repentance in, in the Messiah. So that's not secular stuff today either. So we get away from those things. And they talk about there's a time to withdraw from society, uh, not be a part of a gang-infested city, but come to the country, grow your crops, not crops, but just grow your food, be a family that takes care of each other. So really interesting. But I'm rambling now. So let's go to the next question. Um, I know that fragments of Tobit have been found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. What do you think about the validity of the book of Tobit? Um, actually, fragments of several of the Apocrypha were found. Not all of them, like I, probably just two or three. I think it was Tobit, Sirach. Um, and I forget, there's a couple. On our network, we have all those listed. Uh, but as far as Tobit goes, it wasn't just fragments. It's one of those rare cases where you've got the entire book. Uh, so maybe with a whole, you know, one or two words missing because of a hole in the in the, pa the paper or something, but basically the whole book. Um, so it's interesting. Basically, the teaching is that the, the Old Testament is inspired and put together as it is in a canon form, that concept of a canon, and it's closed. So for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit, if we believe the Ezra apocalypse, which is outside the canon, but basically its teaching is that Ezra was inspired by the Holy Spirit to form the canon, to close it, and to create a uh, Aramaic targum, a translation of the whole canon for the people that just came back from Babylon that didn't speak Hebrew very well. So the Aramaic part. And so the basic idea is that the Bible the Old Testament, and for us, the New Testament, is all we need for life and godliness and, and salvation. And you don't want someone to be thinking, I have to read literally 15,000 books before I can even figure out how to be saved. So you don't want that. You want just a public canon, which is actually pretty big as it is. So, But outside the public canon, we have accurate histories, accurate prophecies, and other things. So Sirach is probably my favorite wisdom book outside the Bible. Proverbs is great. Uh, I Probably my favorite wisdom book in general would be the book of James in the New Testament. And I don't dwell on the wisdom stuff that often because I'm always in scrolls, but James and Proverbs, and I don't care that much for Ecclesiastes, but it's it's got some good stuff in there. But a Sirach or Ecclesiastic, it's Wisdom of Solomon. All, all those are pretty good. And there are pieces of them from the from the scrolls. And that's why we thought the testaments of the patriarchs were fake, because the one in the Armenian or Syriac, whichever one in that one canon, um, is too Christian. But we find out from the Dead Sea Scrolls that was the theology back then. And pieces of those are were actually found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So it's not fiction, it's actually real. So it's a really interesting thing to pull together. So, um, yeah, Tobit's interesting. Uh, there's that one, I think there's one little bitty prophecy about something happening toward the end of it. But it's just you know, basic history now. But um, it's an interesting story about uh, Tobias and uh, Susanna. Is it Susanna? The, his wife he's supposed to take. And uh, my favorite quote in Tobit is uh, when Raphael tells Tobias, don't fear to take her as your wife. She was ordained from you, for you from before the foundation of the, of the world. And that is just so cool. I don't, I'm not a Calvinist, and I don't think that's necessarily for everybody. But to have an angel tell you, you were supposed to marry him or her it just right now. 
you know, we, we had, they had previously marriages and the people died and things like that. But what's going on right now, don't get scared because this is what it's supposed to be like. So, and it's just really cool. One of, one of my favorite verses from it. I don't know how, you know, in there it talks about taking the gall of a fish, if it's translated right, the tiny fish, and if it really is gall, but some, something from a fish and using it as a fumigation type thing or to burn like an incense or whatever, um, drove the demon away. Now, whether we're talking about an ailment or an actual demonic presence and some sort of herbal medicine, uh, it's kind of interesting because it's not actually medicine like I think of. It's more like, um, well, there's herbal medicine and then there's the, um, what do you call that stuff? Um, the fragrances. I can't, can't think of the name of it. Um, yeah. Anyway, when you, you put in a, put an herb in a diffuser and you just, it puts the smoke in the air and you breathe it all night long. My mind is slipping, but anyway, so it's a different kind of herbal medicine, basically. So it's, it's pretty interesting. So I would not necessarily recommend it, but it's really interesting and may have some good parts to it. Uh, and that's what I would say. So we always want to look at that. Back when I was in seminary, they said, forget about the Apocrypha because, number one, it's supposed to be the writings of the Hebrews. And it's in Greek, but it's not in Hebrew. There's not a Hebrew copy anywhere. Well, that makes you wonder if it's not fake. That's a really, really good point. Except the Dead Sea Scrolls, now apparently they did exist in Hebrew. So the story is not wrong. Now, it probably contains errors, like I know Judith has an error in it. It's talking about the Assyrians coming down, and it mentions Nebuchadnezzar. Well, he's Babylonian, not Assyrian. So somebody slipped that name in, maybe just trying to clarify, but it has been garbled slightly. So pretty, pretty interesting to talk about. Good questions. What is the date that is calculated to Nissan 10? For the triumphal entry um i don't i don't know necessarily we can look that up so dss calendar this year anyway nissan 10 was on a monday no that's april excuse me okay nissan 10 would have been on a friday it was been on, been on a sabbath so uh, Friday and then Passover was on Tuesday. So of, the, of that week, the 10th to the 14th. So um, not sure exactly where you were going with that, but be an interesting thing to study. It is interesting how the Dead Sea Scrolls give us three days and three nights between the crucifixion and the, the resurrection. So... Herodotus said the Magi first appeared in the 7th century BC in the kingdom of the Medes. Northern tribes were taken captive and placed in the towns where the Medes were at the same time. Were the Magi of the lost tribes? Uh, yes and no. The, the legend is that the Medes and the Persians took over Babylon. Daniel was made the chief of the Magi or the chief of the magicians there in Babylon. And then the Medes and Persians took over. And then we had all that stuff happen with Darius and all that. So the story is that the good part or accurate part of the Magi were from Daniel and his teachings. And we get this from several church fathers that actually give us the story of the Magi that visited, uh, that took, followed the star of Bethlehem and found the, the Messiah. Their backstory, where they came from, what they thought of, stuff, stuff like that. I didn't know I had a QR code up there. Anyway, <laughs> so um, it's interesting to see that. It's an amazing story. We'll have to put that up sometime too. I've talked about it before, but it's really interesting just to see that. We've got Matthew's account, which is a real brief account of them coming in. And the it's a, just an amazing account to look at that. So that was that's from, uh, I think it's Julius Africanus that gives that whole thing from the, from, the Persian archives, and then there's Origin and a couple other guys that mention that specifically. So basically, that, that would be a, a proper understanding. So they are believers 
in the Magi group. Um, Magi, you know, means magician or dreamer, or interpreter, or holy man, something like that. But it came to mean court official. It's just like a eunuch. A eunuch is somebody that is, what is the word? Not circumcised, but completely um, no longer male. So anyway, um, but that's specifically what it means. But it came to mean a high court official. So you could have a high court official that doesn't delve in magic and that is not a eunuch, but still might be called a eunuch or a magi. So it's an interesting way that goes. But so there was a group of the magi that were believers and uh, knew the prophecies of Daniel. And so that's when they saw the star and then the king had a strange dream. And when they put it all together, they're like, we need to go find the savior of the world, you know. And so it was a really interesting story. And didn't, uh, see, didn't Ken say that believers were taken before the flood too? Yeah, according to the records, everyone that was a believer died peacefully in their sleep before the flood. Uh, that's in the book of Jasher. And, and why, that's interesting too, because whether you think Jasher is fake or accurate, it's a very, very old document. It would have nothing to do with Christianity. So why would it mention that? And it's just interesting because the whole concept is, you know, whether the rapture happens tomorrow or a hundred years from now, if it's a hundred years from now, I will die before the rapture, you know, it's guaranteed, uh, even if I'm in the scene. So um, anyway, but it's interesting to see that it, it mentions that um, uh, Enoch's child was Methuselah and Methuselah. If you break that down, meth means dead. Selah means to send. So Methuselah actually means when he is dead, it shall be sent. And this was a prophecy because Enoch knew about the coming flood and he actually named his child this. So it's interesting. Everyone knew when Methuselah dies, it's the end of the world. And when you look at it, it's really interesting. Just from Genesis, you can tally it up and know that he died the year of the flood. You look at Jasher and a couple of other things. He died exactly one week before the flood. Now, he died. They buried him. And then it says they went into the ark. God shut the door and they were in the ark for one week. So to me, it's interesting. They actually bury him in the morning. And then walk into the ark and God himself shuts the door that afternoon. That's pretty specific. That's like not even to the day, but that's like down to the hour. So they're in there for a week and then the flood comes. But yeah, it mentions everyone who knew the Lord in those days died peacefully. And the only one that was left other than Noah, his three sons and his three grandsons, and then Nama, Noah's wife. Besides the, the eight that went on the ark, it was just Methuselah. And he died and was buried. I don't know if he died a few days before, but he died and was buried that uh, one week before the flood. It's amazing, isn't it? When we look at that stuff, the kind of patterns we see. And then, of course, why did they shut? Why did God himself shut the door and leave Noah in the ark for seven days? What's the seven day meaning because he could have done it in two seconds maybe a seven-year period i mean there's lots of patterns like that and maybe it doesn't mean that but it probably means something very very fascinating studying those things we can get way off studying those things and i understand that but when you get extra biblical documents that are just historical that just happen to mention something like that that's just too coincidental uh, Ken taught us that Noah built the ark in five years. Is that right, too? I hear pastors teaching that it took 90 years um, all the time. I never heard the 90, but I hear 120. When you read Genesis, it says that there's going to be 120 years, and then all of a sudden they build the ark. And so it's easy to assume it's 120 years, and they built the ark in one year, and then waited 120, and the flood came. It could be saying that. All it's saying is that here's 120 mark, and in here somewhere they built an ark, and then at the end of the 120 mark, the flood came. 
And so Jasher mentions that it was 120 years for repentance. And Noah and Methuselah were supposed to go around preaching basically the gospel, repentance. Didn't get a single convert. And they continued doing that and were faithful. And then five years before the time was out, God said, okay, enough, build, a, build an ark. And here's how you do it. And they built the ark. It took them five years. And so, and I'm assuming that it might actually be before that, but it took five years total to build. And then it sat there for, you know, five minutes, five years, whatever. But it's interesting to see that. I always thought that was amazing because a lot of times you, we, we try to preach to people or witness to family members and it doesn't work. And you think, Lord, why don't you send someone else? Because I'm not, I'm doing a lousy job. Well, sometimes people don't get saved. Other times they do at the last minute. Other times it takes you and someone else. And I think the point being, you need to keep on keeping on. Noah and Methuselah were not stupid. If I was with Noah and Methuselah and even five years went by, I'd be saying something's wrong. We're not making any converts. I'm not going to continue to do this for 100 years because, you know, the, the prophecy at the end of the 120. And of course, they would say, if that's what the Lord told you to do, that's what you will do. Is that understood? Yeah, but we're not we're not effective. It doesn't matter. The Lord told you to do something. Do it. Maybe something will be effective later. Probably not because this is not working out. But just be a witness. And that's amazing. Even if you know it's not going to work, you still witness for Christ. And you don't know that it's not working. So, again, since it did say that all those who knew the Lord died in those days right before the flood, maybe they did have some converts. There could have been a handful, but not enough to make any difference. And so the Lord took them. That's a possibility, too. So maybe they actually did save some people. I don't know for sure, but it's really interesting to look at. Did you call Ecclesiast Ecclesiastes in Syriac? Um, well, I was saying that um, um, Ezra formed the canon and closed it but then turned around and wrote uh, what's called Targum, which is the, the Aramaic or the Syriac version of the Old Testament. So that's where we get the Targums from. So that might have been what I was saying. Ecclesiasticus is an apocryphal work, part of the apocrypha, and, you know, like in the middle of the King James Bible. And then Ecclesiastes was the one written by Solomon. So it's all Hebrew in our Bible, but there is a Targum version of it. I think that's what I was saying. So those books like Tobit and Syriac are historical. Why were they removed from our canon? Um, I don't know that they were ever removed because like I say, they were adding books to the canon and then at one point it was closed so that we have uh, what we would call 39 books in a public canon for the public to look at. Not that there's anything secret or hidden that we don't want someone to know, but just it's just like if someone was thinking of becoming a Christian or wanting to, or just a new believer, just memorize the New Testament and then throw in some Genesis so you know who we're talking about in Galatians and stuff, but mainly just stick to the New Testament so you can understand. And then you've got the New Testament memorized, kind of all the concepts, go to the old, see the differences. You got all that taken care of. If you still have time and you want to read stuff, read the history books and stuff. So it's not so much that they were removed but um, whoever put together the Septuagint went ahead and put them in. But the Hebrew tradition is that Ezra closed the canon the way it is. So, And it's not a big deal, but we just want to not add to the canon because that's forbidden. According to, to uh, the Old and the New Testament, you're not supposed to add to it. Uh, and we're not. We're simply saying the canon is the canon. It, it, we, we judge everything by the 66 books of the Old and New Testament. But we look at these other things too. Matter of fact, that's what was interesting to me. One of the texts talks about this, you know, Jesus is always condemning the scribes and the Pharisees. He never condemns the Essenes. And what's interesting is the Pharisees had 
what the original Pharisees knew to be fake, a oral Torah. So Moses told us this is the way you interpret it. And that's bull. It's not true. So and everybody would say that's not true. You're lying. You're a cult. OK, but then the, the Essenes came out and said, we know you're lying. We know you're a cult because we have the testaments of the patriarchs, the historical writings. I know what Jacob himself taught. I have his testament. I have uh, Levi's testament. I know about salvation and the coming Messiah being God incarnate. He talked about all that stuff. So now you're saying the Messiah is just a general and there is no virgin birth. And just, you know, you're lying. Well, Moses said. No, Moses would not have said that. There's no way. It's a lie. And so they turned around and said, well, the testaments of the patriarchs that you have, they really did. They really did exist. But what you have is fiction. So you're the liar. You know, and so there, you get this in-house debate going on. But what was interesting is that the scribes, the scribes said, well, we don't know which set is right and which set is wrong. And we're not going to mess with it. We're only going to look at the scriptures. And that sounds like wisdom at first, but basically you get to a passage, you don't understand what it is, and you and I would just simply take a wild guess on what we think it might mean. The logical thing to do would be to go back to the his history text, see what was going on, and then you'd probably know exactly for sure what it means. You wouldn't have to guess. And so it sounds like wisdom staying away from extra biblical history text and stuff and just sticking with the scriptures. But if your goal is to teach the scriptures and teach them correctly, you need to know. It would be like me saying it's a sin for you to study Hebrew because there is no Hebrew primer text in the Bible. You're going to an extra biblical document to learn Hebrew. Well, yeah, I have to. I wasn't taught it by my parents. So it's that kind of a thing. So we need to always do that. So what's interesting to me is Jesus would say, woe to the scribes and the Pharisees. They're hypocrites. So the Pharisees are a hypocrite because they have a fake history and they know it's fake. Like a lot of our denominations have these supposed histories where their founders, you know, did miracles and all. You know, it's a lie. So it's fake history. And then the Sadducees or the, uh, it, the scribes saying, we're just going to take wild guesses. We don't want to study history. Well, then you're a hypocrite. You're wanting to be a teacher but you don't want to study history. So it's interesting by saying scribes and Pharisees are hypocrites. He's actually siding with his scenes or Zadok priests. I just thought that was kind of interesting. And it's a good lesson for us in, in this kind of a thing. The Bible is the Bible. There's nothing outside the Bible that is on par with scripture. Everything is to be judged by the 66 books. And I know that's weird that it's 66, but it is what it is. But, we still need to be aware of our history books. So if someone says, add something to the canon, we don't want to do that. If someone says, don't read anything outside the canon, we don't want to do that either. Because we don't want to be a hypocrite. In Tobit, when Tobias asked the angel Raphael his name, he said, I am Azarus, the son of the great Ananias, one of your relatives. Did he lie or is there some truth to be found in that? I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and look that up. Uh, the first thing I would do is uh, compare that translation to the one in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I think we have that. As a matter of fact, I think I have it somewhere, but I don't, I've don't. i never published it or anything. To see if that's in there. Because a lot of times there's uh, other stuff added or whatever. So I'm not sure how... Yeah, I wouldn't expect an angel to lie. I expect them to, I guess you kind of sort of do that when they appear to be a person and just try to make you think they're just a person and see how you do. But I wouldn't call that a lie. So I'm not sure what really is going on there. We'd have to look at it a little bit closer. But we should have the entire text. So if it's not there, it's been added. If it is, then it's something interesting to study. Uh, aren't we not going to be married in heaven? Is this mentioned anywhere else besides when Jesus talked about it? Um, I think it is mentioned in Enoch, actually. Jesus basically said, we'll be like the angels that didn't leave their first estate. 
the angels that left their first estate, according to uh, Clement of Rome, who was dis Peter's disciple, said that Peter told him that they metamorphosized, became somewhat human-like. Uh, they're still definitely superior, but at the same time, they're not angels anymore. They're stuck down here, so to speak. Uh, and they were able to do whatever they did to get married and all that kind of stuff. The angels that didn't leave their first estate, they don't marry, they don't die, they don't reincarnate, they don't do anything like that. They're just eternal. Um, but yeah, I think it is mentioned in Enoch somewhere, and I'd have to look that up. Um, if you get my book of Enoch on the in the first chapter, there's an introduction, and I list most of the prophecies and things like that, if it's mentioned in there, because that's, that's a big part of the book of Enoch, is the watchers falling. And I think it's in there. Uh, I was looking for the date of Artaxerxes, and I think it was made oh, when he made his decree and how the date of the triumphal entry was calculated. Something like 445, yeah, 444 or 445 BC. Yeah, and we can get it down to give or take that year. And so it, it fits when you make it 445, and it's one of those things that's kind of confusing. But you get that in, I believe it's in... Um, Nehemiah chapter 2, when Nehemiah goes to Artaxerxes, says that it's Artaxerxes, and it says it was in his 20th year. And so that uh, presumably means his 20th year has not started yet. It was, you know, like if you're in your first year, you've been one day, and then on your first year anniversary, you begin your second year. So it's something like that. So it's always, and it depends on how they use the language. So it's either 444 or 445 B.C., and that's kind of the confusing part about it. Almost everything, when you try to nail it down, it's give or take a year. And I, it, you would think it'd be easier to figure stuff out like that. But today, I even see when you go to look at when the this temple was destroyed by Titus, they always say uh, 69 or 70 AD. And most people say it's 70, but almost everybody still says 69 or 70. I always thought that's interesting. 120 years for migration. Oh, that could be. That's interesting. I The, the 120 is, a, is an interesting number, too, because we have 120 jubilees, 50-year periods, between creation and the new creation. So it's really interesting uh, with that. So there's a 120-year, there's a 120-year um, in, in several prophecies like that. So there's more that we need to study for sure. Okay, just a couple more questions and then we'll call it done for today. Did Methuselah help Noah build the ark? Uh, he definitely could have. There's no record that said that he did or didn't. Um, but if he died um, when it was finished, well, actually a week before the flood occurred is when he died, uh, which goes along with the prophecy. He could have. But if they if they took five years to build it and it was the last five years, he would have been pretty old. So I doubt he was, uh, you know, picking up heavy logs or anything or nailing. Uh, he may have helped in some way. Uh, if it was further back, like closer to the beginning of the 120, then yeah, that may be. So it's a possibility. Okay, and our last question. Why does the 70-week prophecy in Daniel... Divide the first 69 weeks into 62 and then 7. Um, it seems to be that it's the uh, from the decree to when they actually come back and begin building the, uh, the city and then putting the moat around it. And it seems like it took about 49 years to finish the whole thing. Uh, they start and then they have to stop by decree and then they get permission and they start up again. And it's slow because people keep attacking them. And in Ezra and Nehemiah, it talks about how they had to, normally you have your weapon on your side, your sword, if you're going to go to battle. And if we're done with battling, I'm going to take my weapons and sit over there and get my shovel and go build. And in their case, they couldn't do that. They had to have their weapons girded on at all times and try to build, which is cumbersome. You have to go slower because at any minute, somebody's liable to attack. And that's the situation they were in, at least until they got the wall open, or I mean, 
the wall build. So it seems to be 62 weeks to that event and then seven weeks or 49 years to actually finish the wall and the parts of the city so they could live in it and the moat. And that's when, you know, the book of Haggai comes around. It's like, yeah, you've done that now and now you're going to rest. What about my temple? You know, and then they got in trouble for not building the temple. But that's basically the, the reasoning. And then then there's the split because at the end of the seven, which is the 62 and then the seven, you have the um, um, the prince that comes and destroys the city and the sanctuary. And then you've got the um, um, with the sanctuary destroyed, you have the end as a desolation. So that's Israel being kicked out of their land. So for it to be fulfilled, they have to come back, then get the temple mount back, then build a temple, then the next verse can occur. So you see in that verse, just the way that it's written, a, a, an incredible gap. And you see that kind of gap in a lot of prophecies. There's one in, in a couple of different prophecies in Enoch, here in Daniel chapter 9, and you see that kind of thing happening repeatedly. Okay, we'll go ahead and stop there for tonight, and uh, we'll pick up again next week. So this week, uh, we've done this on Monday, and then uh, normally we have a broadcast, our church broadcasts a Thursday night study, uh, but it's going to be uh, the conference. It's going to start Thursday night. So we're going to have speakers. It's a Bible conference Thursday night, all day Friday, and then Saturday morning. So, but we will be back next week for, or next Monday uh, for another one. So uh, I'll go ahead and say good night. Thank you guys. God bless.